Welcome to the RE Podcast, the first dedicated RE podcast for students and teachers. My name is Louisa Jane Smith and this is the RE Podcast and the next episode in the special collaboration we have with Ashkundi on the decolonisation of RE. Ashkundi is head of RE in Yorkshire and is also the founder of Teacher Consciousness, a movement based on a belief of equity and authenticity in the curriculum. We mentioned that we would collaborate again, and we are, and this time we are looking at the decolonization of Judaism. In this episode, we are going to discuss how we can more authentically teach Judaism, and we have welcomed back to the RE podcast, Rabbi Benjamin Sheldrake. Rabbi, welcome again, and just would you introduce yourself again for our listeners? Thank you. Yeah, it's a real pleasure to be back. And yeah, my name is Rabbi Benjamin Sheldrake. I'm the rabbi here in Adat Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Norwich. I'm also a member of the exec of the Union of British Messianic Synagogues and the United Messianic Synagogues, which is the international outreach arm of the National Union. And I'm the president of the UMS in that role as well. So I've got multiple hats. I also do all the rabbinic intern training here and obviously the conversion classes and things that we do in the synagogue as well as the teaching. So I'm the lead rabbi here in the synagogue. There are others in our leadership team as well. So briefly, that is me. Ash, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. Do you just want to quickly explain the term decolonization? Yeah. So decolonization is effectively looking at the removal of the colonial lens that the curriculum often presents, reflecting on why that colonial lens has often shown itself to be at the forefront, but then making sure that we're representing communities as they are and not necessarily what we think they are, showing that we're as authentic as possible when representing mm. communities across yeah. the globe. So before we get you know any deeper, Rabbi, Something that we're really curious about is when talking about Judaism, what in your mind is perhaps the most authentic language that we could be using when referring to the tradition? If that, if you're even referring to it as a tradition is the right word. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it opens up a huge can of worms, doesn't it? Even before we begin to answer that question, we have to ask ourselves, what do we even mean by Judaism? It's very easy to label something with broad brushstrokes and actually cause a huge amount of offence and harm. One of the problems that we have, of course, is that for most people, and I guess as you as RE teachers will be fully aware of this, you know, you open up on any RE textbook on Judaism, and I guarantee you it'll be filled with pictures wearing black hats, long locks on the side, black and white, you know, clothing, seat seat hanging around the thighs and so on. It'll be largely male dominated. You know, you'll have pictures of rabbis and other Jewish men at prayer and so on. Very few, I would suspect, of Jewish women at prayer. You'll have pictures of the famous Jewish sites in Jerusalem, the Temple, the Western Wall, and so on, all those kind of things, plus the usual bits and pieces, shall we say, the realia of Judaism, whether it's the Lulavim from Sukkot or Dreidel, and the, the usual bits and pieces. All of this is normal in terms of most people's understanding when they're looking at this, but what most people fail to understand, the moment they do that, what they're doing is actually teaching a version of Judaism to the children. And I mean it's just a version of Judaism. What people mean by Judaism often is rabbinic Judaism, or in modern terms, orthodox Judaism today. Now, those terms really do mean something. For most people, they don't because they just think Judaism is what you see, and most people see black and white coats. And that is why they tend to go for that as the picture of what Judaism is. I have to say the vast, and I mean vast, majority of Jewish people do not fit into that mold in any way, shape or form. You're looking at an Ashkenazi Eastern European model and concept of Judaism, which has been brought down the ages, which now fairly dominates the world. There are so many other ways that we can cut this cake. First and foremost, we can talk about Ashkenazi Jews from Eastern Europe versus the Sephardi Jews who are the Spanish, North African, Middle Eastern Jews. Ashkenazi Jews tend to look very European. Yeah, that's fairly obvious. We know what they look like from the textbooks in in schools. Sephardi Jews look very Middle Eastern. We're talking olive skin, dark eyes, dark hair, look very different. And they've had a very, very different history. Again, while we're talking about the history of this, you know, for most, when we talk about Jewish people, we touched upon this earlier, Louisa, but you know, when we talk about Judaism instantly for most people, we then think, oh, the Holocaust, 
the results of the Holocaust, the impact of the Holocaust upon Jewish thinking and Jewish history, 1948, re-establishment of Israel and so on. And yet actually for the Sephardi community, the Holocaust was not as big, clearly because they were largely untouched by this. In fact, it's the Inquisition for the Sephardi community, which was their big emotional, mental issue in history, in the mind. And so we just put this label of Judaism upon things, and we then fail to understand the complexities of what Judaism is. And as I said to you already, even when we talk about Judaism, Judaism as a word was only coined by Christianity. And when it wanted to define something against which it was fighting. Up to that point, Judaism wasn't used. You've got people of Yehuda, those who lived in that geographical area, the Yehudim. That's where you lived. This is what you did. But it wasn't a faith. It wasn't a religion. It wasn't that. And this whole concept of religion and labeling it in this way is such a modern idea. And again, to quote your boy Arim, and Brent, that I mentioned earlier in his wonderful book, Beyond Religion, shows in, in their works here that you know, even the term religion is such a late term. You're talking about 18th century before these words are beginning to be used in any kind of cognitive way in, in it to describe things in that Victorian classification mode, which really frames so much of our Western thinking. We've got something, we've got to box it, we've got to put a label on it. And this is the way that then you know, people in the West and in the UK with their own colonial attitudes, of course, going around the world, what they did. They went somewhere, they looked at it, they labelled it, they boxed it, comparing it to their own British cultural backgrounds. And that's how a lot of these labels then come about on around the world. And Christianity did exactly the same. With Judaism, it labelled it, it then stigmatised it, and began to persecute it as the other which it did not want to be. And there's so much research coming out now from looking at the early so-called church fathers who were writing deliberately, not as it were to protect a Christianity, because it didn't exist until Constantine's time period. It just didn't. I mean, to talk about that is just a complete historical lie. What the Church Fathers were doing through those 400 years was stigmatizing Judaism systematically and creating a border, an orthodoxy of their own, to try and pull people out of Judaism. Now, that's a huge historical issue which needs to be addressed straight away but that process of stigmatization was constantly going on okay so when we talk about judaism we cannot just talk about orthodoxy even the term orthodox judaism only was labeled orthodox once reformed judaism started in the late 1800s and into the 1900s once reformed judaism started then orthodox judaism had to label itself where so well we're not that we're this we're the orthodox then because you're not orthodox you're reformed and so the label sticks. And we talk about these things with comparative ease today, but actually there is a history behind terminology always in linguistics and in, in language use. And we have to drill down and examine how we're using words. For Judaism, for Reformed Jews, does not mean orthodoxy. For Messianic Jews, it does not mean orthodoxy. For liberal Jews, it doesn't mean orthodoxy. And that's before we even get on to the secular and the atheist Jews who actually, by and large, make up the vast, vast percentage of Jewish people on the planet. Orthodox Judaism represents a marginal, marginal percentage of Jewish people anywhere. And yet their projection of their power and their dominance is such that people think that that is what Judaism is, and it represents all Jewish people. And it's just simply not true. And it's certainly for us in Messianic Judaism, you know, we're challenging that concept, we're challenging that image of that dominance and hegemony of, of rabbinic Judaism. And I call it rabbinic Judaism because in the first century, only two forms of Judaism came out of the first century. There were Messianic Jews and there were rabbinic Jews. Rabbinic Jews because of Yavne, the development of the Talmud, of course, which you'll be, both be aware of. That came through the rabbinic Jewish spectrum, whereas Messianic Jews continued as Messianic Jews up through those 400 years until the Roman Catholic Church effectively stamped on it and began to really eradicate it and, and persecute it to death. Only two forms of Judaism came out of that first century. And that's why I'm saying we have to be really clear in our language, Rabbinic Judaism, Messianic Judaism, and they are effectively sisters. You know, some people believe that somehow Messianic Judaism came out of Rabbinic Judaism. It didn't. The two were developing in parallel around about the end of the first century and into the second century. 
There's some fantastic research being done on this um, recently, and it's all being written up now and produced. And it's, thank goodness, it's about time. We need to see some of this. because It's really correcting historical wrongs and perceptions of that time period, which only feed into the gatekeeper's current view of maintaining the status quo. And I'm the kind of guy who says, I don't care about the status quo, I'm going to blow it up. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we've got to change. Can I just ask a follow-up question on that? You yeah, please do, yeah. I mean, it's fascinating because the thing is, that I don't think it's common knowledge what you're talking about, to be honest with you. I think it's knowledge that isn't, clearly isn't mainstream. No, it isn't. But what I want to know about is what's the impact that that's had for members of the community? I mean, is it frustration? Is it, I mean, you don't even have mm. to attach an emotion to it, but what is the impact that that has within the community in terms of its development and its perception of itself? Oh, I mean, again, it's, it's absolutely huge. And as I said, there's also a linguistic background by training as well, so I can focus a little bit upon this, but even, even the very use of labels, for instance, in the scriptures saying Old Testament and New Testament, rubbish, it's nonsense. You know, those are labels which the church imposed upon the scriptures to demarcate where they really felt they should be with, right? The new. Jewish people don't talk about the Old Testament, we talk about the Tanakh. It's always been the Tanakh, right? We talk about the so-called New Testament as the Messianic writings. We don't even use those kind of words anymore because I think, again, that is your colonization approach, isn't it? We're taking over this space and we're going to relabel it, rebrand it and use it for our own purposes. So that's a very simple one. Another one which will shock many people, I would think, as well. In our English Bibles, in the so-called New Testament, we've got this letter of James. Now, in every other Bible in the world for, that I've read, certainly, and there may be languages I've not read, but it's certainly all the ones that I have seen, it's not called the Book of James, it's called the Book of Jacob. Now, that was its original name, the Book of Yaakov. And do you know why it's now called the Book of James in the English Bible? Because they named it after King James, because the king wanted a book in the Bible named after himself. Now, how insane is that? It's not the Book of James. Now, this is the level we're working on here, you know? And again, as you say, Ash, I doubt that's common knowledge. But this is the level that we are working on, that kings are able to actually say, oh, I know what, I'll take a bit of that Bible, make it put my name on it, because I quite like the idea of that. You know, it's ludicrous. This is the colonization of the scriptures. So we call it the Book of Yaakov. One last thing that I want to ask. <laughs> I haven't got any, I've only just started here, Ash. I've got about like half an hour on this deck. Oh, one last thing I want to ask about. Sorry, Louis. That's all right. <laughs> I feel redundant here. <laughs> <laughs> because when you talk like this, I mean, I'm assuming this is the first time you've spoken like this because you know, you're clearly very eloquent. What's the response and the reaction that you usually get when you are to speak to people like this? And so, whether people who aren't part of the community who you are trying to yeah. authenticate the community effectively, What's the kind of response that you receive? Is it usually positive, negative, somewhere in the middle, neutral? You know, what is, what is it? As you would expect, I suspect, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to individuals who are doing their own research, who are open, want to understand more, enjoy looking through history, looking at reasons of why theology has come about and so on, then for those kind of people, then we find enormous openness and excitement about what we're saying because, you know, we've been very careful in our own union here to really base our vision, if you want to use that word, on the academic research that is currently going on. You know, we really root all of this into something which is substantial, it is real, it's being done by experts, researchers, professors, both Jewish and Christian, I have to say on the first century and there's a lot of work now coming out on this so you know we're very careful as you say to talk about that authenticity element we've got to be based on something it can't just be wishful thinking and so we're very very careful to make sure that we do this the reaction from institutions of course is going to be different and often is because it's the institutions which are the gatekeepers and it's the institutions who have most to lose Hasn't it always thus been? You know, it's always the priests who fight back because they've got most to lose. This has always been the case, I, th I would suspect, probably in any religious group. But, you know, this is often what we find. And it's, it's fascinating because most of the research now is saying quite clearly that the supposed parting of the ways, as it's called, as a theological topic from the first century, most experts in that field are saying that the parting of the ways happened really late at least 400 years after the first century, if not up to a thousand years after the first century. That is becoming the de facto academic professional historical opinion on both sides of the divide. 
But on an institutional divide, it's quite interesting because the parties which are now directly affected by a lot of this actually prefer the split to be really early. And they are the ones who are trying to drive it back to the fact, well, actually, this Jesus, by the way, that's another colonial word while we're at it, because that wasn't his name. His name was Yeshua. He was a Jew, right? He did not have an English name. Not that Jesus means anything in English, because it doesn't. It's just a word. But it's another colonial aspect, if you want to put it that way. That what both church and synagogue would like to be the case is for this Jesus to have come along and created a brand new religion in the first century preferably around about 13 CE. As I've always said to people, I said, look, I'm happy to change my view on this, but please quote anywhere, and I mean anywhere, Tanakh, Messianic writings, or any of the so-called church fathers, or any of those original ancient documents we've got anywhere where it says that Yeshua came to start a new religion. There's nothing. And I mean, literally, there is an echoing vacuum. There is nothing. In fact, Yeshua himself said, and this is again something which, how you look at scriptures and how you view it and how you're blinded to what you're reading, Yeshua said, you know, I have not come to do away the Torah, Matthew 5. Now, if he's not come to do away the Torah, how on earth is it that you've got an institution called the church, which is saying that we're not keeping the Torah anymore, when their own founder apparently said that he's not come to do away with it? I just scratch my head and wonder. This is cultural blindness, it's colonial blindness. You'd call it what you want. You can read something and not even read what you're reading. It really is as clear as the sun in the sky. Again, we talked about this and other issues, how names are used. And we talk about Peter and John and Mary and so on, as if they're all our mates down the pub. They were not British. It's Miriam, Kepha, Yohanan. These are all first century Jewish names. The moment we translate names into English, we are colonializing their identities and making them into nice good christian boys and girls and it's got to stop it's got to stop the other thing the greek now this is a slightly one so let me i'll just talk about the greek bit then then ash can come back and drill me some more but the whole concept of this is that the messiah writings are written in greek and that's important because it's not hebrew which you can see is already distancing itself absolute nonsense the Septuagint translation the lxx is often written down as which was a translation of the Torah into Greek happened well before Yeshua's time in the first century. And it was translated into Greek because it was used effectively as an evangelistic outreach tool. First of all, into Alexandrian Egypt and beyond, but Greek was the lingua franca of the day. And in effect, it was used to translate it into words which the general population would understand to extol how wonderful Judaism is. And this is exactly the reason why we've got the Masonic writings in Greek and not Hebrew, but essentially it's a Hebrew document. That is what it is. It's full of Jewish ways of thinking. I'll give you a real classic example, just, just a couple of examples here. People often say, oh, well, Yeshua never claimed to be God. And yet all the way through the Masonic writings, you've got people saying to him, Lord, 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 right? Just open it anywhere, just flick through a couple of pages, you're going to see it. Which we know, you know, you know, in the Greek, you've got Kyrios is what lies behind that translation of Lord. What most people don't understand is that Kyrios is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Adonai, which is the tetragrammaton of the name of God. And so you've got people in the first century literally walking around saying to Yeshua effectively, my God, my God, what do you think of this? And that blows your brains out straight away when you see that because it's a Hebrew document. This is how crazy, but because it's been overlaid by Greek and then English and all the other translations, you miss the fact that behind it all is this Hebrew that runs there. Again, another one, Ecclesia, right? This will be common to you, possibly Louise, or I don't know how, how deep your understanding is of first century Koine Greek, but Ecclesia, which we translated as the church. Ecclesia is the Greek word which was chosen to translate the Hebrew word kehila. Kehila means a Jewish congregation. It does not mean a church. And yet, lo and behold, when you open up your Messiah writings in English, you've got church this and church that. And they weren't churches. They were kahilot. They were Hebrew congregations and synagogues. There it is again. How terminology literally concretes over another cultural background. And you talked, Ash, at the beginning, and rightly so, about the ethnographic approach when we do these things. You've got to go in and record what is, not what you want it to be. You know, and as challenging as it always is to lay down our own cultural lenses when we're doing that, 
we know we absolutely must not let that happen. You know, any ethnographic approach to the Masonic writings is absolutely going to conclude this is a Jewish document of the first century. In fact, Alan Siegel, one of our great Jewish professors, academics and researchers on this, is talking about uh, multiple Judaisms of the first century. Again, what is Judaism? And he talks about this and he says, you know, so often he says, you know, we've used the Talmud as the Jewish context to understand the New Testament. He says, actually, this is completely the wrong way around. He says the New Testament was written before the Talmud. He says we should be using the New Testament to explain what the Talmud means. Now that blows it out the water. And he's an Orthodox rabbi, a researcher, professor, no axe to grind particularly, except that he's just chasing the facts. And he says really what we've got in the scriptures there in terms of the Masonic writings, this is prima facie, first century evidence of a Judaism that existed, which most people today completely ignore. Mind blowing. Now, at the minute, most of this is on an academic, it's filtering down. It is beginning to filter down. Of course, there's a lot of people out there trying to stop it filtering down. The institutions have got most to lose in all of this, but that is beginning to filter down. And it's going to deeply challenge people's conceptions and understandings, both of what Judaism is, but also what Christianity is as well. Look out for some big shaking. Yes. <laughs> Rabbi, can I just, what I feel a need to do, because I am not an academic and <laughs> I am not. You know, I try and have to try and oh, okay. make things right. really, really simple. I just want to try and break down. Yeah. I don't want to be too reductive. So my apologies if I am. I want to break down what I've understood from what you've said so far. Mm. I think, first of all, that the word Judaism is problematic. So that's the first thing, that this is a word used by Christianity in order to control, compartmentalize and reduce something which is much more complex. That, that was its root, and I think it's, it's yes. far more fluid than the monolithic concept yeah. that we have of it, certainly. Yeah. Yes. The other thing is that we compartmentalise that further into orthodox or reform or whatever, and actually, mm -hmm. really, at the heart of it, we've got rabbinic and messianic Judaism, Yeah. and that maybe that's a more interesting demarcation between the different factions yeah. within it. Historically, that is true, yeah. Another thing is an assumption of a shared history, that Jews are a group of people with a shared history, and that actually that's not true that different Jews have had a very different history, some of which impacted by the Holocaust, some of yeah. which not. That there isn't what a Jew looks yeah. like, that there isn't a typical Jew, that we have Jews of every race, colour, nationality, etc. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, and, that, and that idea, of course, came from Hitler's Germany. Yes. And the whole racial theory. I mean, we, I'm assuming amongst friends here that, you know, we know that the concept of race is a myth anyway. It's a framework that's been imposed upon humanity to control humanity. Don't yeah. we know it? You know, yes. you have to go back too far to see the evidence of that. And exactly the same thing was happening in Hitler's Germany. And this whole concept of the size of the nose or the breadth of the forehead, and you know, it is disgusting. Yeah. And and we have to get beyond that. Yes. People will often say, "Oh, we can see who's a Jew." Well, no, you can't. No. You know, I know black Ethiopian Jews. Yes. There is no way you're telling me you can see who's a yes. Jew. <laughs> Then the next thing is really about translation of words. Now, can I clarify something? Because if I've understood this right, this is brand new information to me. Yes. So the first thing I want to talk about is that Old and New Testament are irrelevant terms. That actually we need to use either Tenak or the Messianic writings. Yeah, yeah or the complete Jewish scriptures. Or the complete Jewish scriptures. If we are looking at, say, the Messianic writings, mm. am I right in thinking that they were not written in Greek? They were written in Greek. Okay, okay. No, they were written in Greek, but right. they were written by Jews who spoke Hebrew and Aramaic at that time. Okay. They chose to express those terms in Greek because they were using for a purpose. Right. And in fact, actually, Matthew's Gospel in particular is a really bad Greek text. Okay. In a sense that everywhere you can hear the Hebrew behind it. It's like someone's yeah. really badly translated right. it. Right, okay. It's full of Hebraicisms if you've got eyes to see it. So it's clearly running from a Hebrew paradigm behind it, but yeah. just using the language of Greek for outreach as we would today use English maybe around the world. Yeah. But actually very simple things we could do as our e teacher is using words like Yeshua or Johannes or yes. Miriam rather than Jesus, yes. Mary Absolutely. and John. Please. Please yeah. do. Yes. Please do. His name was Yeshua and not Jesus. Yeah. And I think actually if the children grow up realizing he was a first century Jewish man, however one may perceive him, yes. you know, that is his milieu. That's his zips in Leben, if you want to put it in, a, yeah. a, in an academic term. And he's a Jew of the first century. Yes. And he must be presented as such. And actually using words yeah. like my God, Adonai, rather than Lord. 
which is a much more sort of human term. Or at least explaining the background. To that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so is there some, I mean, I want to talk about how we present this religion. Should we use the word Judaism? Should we use the word religion? I know that there is conversation that's happening within the RE community about renaming our subject, that actually this should be about a worldview and that yeah. these are not religions, that religion is an irrelevant term to most people's lived experience. Should we use Judaism? Should we use religion? What should we use? I really would advise you, Louisa, to read Brent's book, Beyond Religion, because he will really answer a yeah. lot of these questions for you. Fantastic. He really is. And so I won't kind of steal his thunder on that. But while it's reasonably fresh in my mind, his idea really is the fact that the term religion only really has coinage once secularism took over. Mm. There's that dichotomies again. Most people just live their lives. <laughs> And I think that what he and Daniel Biaran's main thesis in all of this is that you can't talk about religion. It's, it's basically how do people structure their lives and live by their values and codes? It's a much broader thing because, you know, Brent actually asked the question at one point in the book, is capitalism a religion? He says, you know, because actually it's defined by an unseen powerful force behind the scenes, market forces that govern everything. He says, but actually, you know, these are the same people who will then decry believers are saying they believe in God and yet apparently they have the same kind of godlike mm. thing that kind of operates everything and pulls the strings and you know he's really kind of hinting at the fact that we've got to get beyond these ism labels the moment we have an ism we can box it and actually life isn't like that life is not an ism it's how people experience it it's how people live it it's what they have as their values and it's the values that link people together that make a community so it's more of an approach saying, oh, you can't say, oh, that's a Jew, or that's this, or a Hindu, or whatever. You know, you've got to say, but what are they doing? What's their practice? How are they living? How can we see this on the spectrum of responses to things outside ourselves and, you know, understanding our own lives and our meaning for life and our reason for existence and so on? When you, that's kind of the level that we would begin to reach. And I'll say that now, back in history, the Yehudim in Hebrew, the Jews, as we translate that today, were people who lived in a particular geographical area and were known for what they did in terms of worship at the temple and the sacrifices they brought and so on. It wasn't a religious thing. That's what their life is. And they would have been very surprised if someone had said, oh, there's a life with this. I mean, of course, no one was an atheist in those days because everyone believed in a God of some sort. The whole concept of secularism is such a late development. Such a recent thing through rational thinking and secularization and the Enlightenment, relatively speaking in human history terms, is a late development. For most of history of humanity, people have believed in deity, if you want to put it in a generic term, because we've understood there is something more powerful than ourselves. You know, and that basic concept is what links ideas, I think, mm -hmm. if you want to put it in its global sense. But yeah. now it was quite an interesting development that happened around the first century because up to that point, even within Jewish thinking, each nation had its own god. And of course, you know, the Roman Empire was happy to absorb all of these tribal deities. It, they were very inclusive in many ways, rather like kind of modern Westers in some ways, although not, not quite so anymore, but that inheritance of it. But what happened around in the first century in Jewish thinking was a move from a kind of parochial particularism to a universal view. And Messianic Judaism in particular moved into this, what we call Jewish universalism today. And there's something really strong on in, in Messianic Judaism, so we could do another podcast on that if you want, but Jewish universalism in terms of actually it's not just for Jewish people, but for anyone who wants to convert and come in too. That shift happened around about the first century, and they were reaching out then to the Gentile nations to say, actually, we've got a message that's so good, it's not just for us. But that is linked, of course, to monotheism. Monotheism, if there's only one God, then there is only one God, and that means everyone ultimately will worship him, right? That's linked to a kind of philosophical, theological concept which goes on there. But this shift happened around about the first century and therefore began to change things. So I don't know how we got onto that, but it was a good, it was a good answer. <laughs> and it's interesting, isn't it? That actually, I'm just thinking as you're talking that nationalism is almost a religion because it's a, a base, yes, you it know, is. it's based isn't on a belief it? in a country, which isn't something that exists. They're imaginary no, no, lines. No, no, no. It, and bizarrely, this is what always makes me smile with this one, because actually, bizarrely, you know, people treat their own nation as a religion and a faith. They really, really do. And yet from a scriptural, from a Torah perspective, you know, there's just the nations. And from a historical view, nations come and go, don't they? Where are the Hittites today? Mm. Can you have a Hittite passport? 
can you get a Canaanite passport? <laughs> I mean, they don't exist anymore. Yeah. Nations come yeah. and go, empires rise and fall. Where was the ancient Babylon, the Persians? Uh, you know, where are they? They're gone. Where was the ancient empire of Egypt? Gone. The ancient empire of Greece, gone. The Roman Empire is only limping along now because of America, one could potentially suggest. Even that's beginning now finally to fall apart. Mm. You know, what we're looking at in the future, maybe a Chinese empire, a Russian empire, but this, this is history. There are no borders set in stone. Mm. There just aren't in that sense. These are human constructs. And, and yes, I think you're right. Nationalism is another religion in that sense yeah. because people commit themselves to it. They fight for it. They kill people for it. You know, they're willing to rule, they rule damage and, and they, they structure their whole lives around it. Well, that's getting yeah. to anyone's understanding. Very close to, you know, a, a system of religion, if you want to call it that. Yeah, but you're right. So another question that I want to ask is, in terms of looking at the tradition within the classroom, from your perspective, what do you find that we get right? And then what are the things that we could improve on? That's quite a difficult question for me to answer because I'm not in a classroom every day. So I... I Probably not entirely sure exactly how you do that now. I mean, I, mm. you know, I, I was actually head of RE many, many years ago when I was a high school teacher. I only did it for a year and it was a very challenging year. But what I do remember, even from that experience, was the sense of, well, first of all, the children really not understanding the relevance of RE, RS, whatever you call it, in the curriculum. And that, of course, is because of the real overload of secularism, which otherwise is taught within the curriculum as the default value. And, you know, religion is not seen as something that has any relevance to the modern world. It's not seen as something which has any influence in the modern world. My comeback on that one, I suppose, first of all, would be to show the children that even today, religion, you know, in that sense, has an enormous impact upon the world. Honestly, one needs only to look at the Middle East to understand that. You know, for people to minimize faith and religious outlook on life and say it has nothing to say to the world is doing a serious harm to people's understanding of the way the world ticks. It's simply not correct. I mean, I suppose Ash as well, from a Hindu background there or something, you know, if you're looking at it in that way, if you look at the way the division of India and, you know, the historical aspects of that with Pakistan and India and faith, religion, impacts everything deeply it truly does and actually maybe am i allowed to say this you have to edit this out maybe if i'm not allowed to say this but <laughs> you know maybe even in our own british political system if faith had had a bigger impact upon our politicians maybe they wouldn't be doing the stupid things sometimes they do <laughs> you know and and maybe they'd sit back and go am i should i be doing that you know i'm not going to get into any more details but you know we need values of that ilk to be impacting our culture for our own sakes and sanities because the moment you begin to abandon that and say that it has no more relevance then we're rapidly sliding towards the law of the jungle mm. the bully wins out the loudest mouth shouts and that is the demise of any culture and society you know we deeply need a if you want to put it religious aspect and, and the children do not understand this. They think it has absolutely no relevance at all. And mm. when I go in and do assemblies in school sometimes, I often sort of point out, you know, that some schools have some rules on the wall in the assembly hall and things. And I say, look, the reason you've even got these is because Judaism gave the world the Ten Commandments. You know, we begin with a structure that says there are things you should not do, mm. because if you do them, it's going to cause harm and damage. And the academic inheritance of that, cultural inheritance of that, that's come down the, the eons is that we work within a legal framework of right and wrong and there's punishments for doing wrong. All of that is an inheritance of this you know, ancient Torah system which has come down through the West. We abandon it at our peril. Mm. We really do, but of course the world is doing that. So that I would say in terms of relevance to show the children that that is true. And also the decompartmentalization of religion has to stop within the classroom. It's not this is this, and that's the only version uh -huh. which is any good, and, and it's the only version that we accept. That has to stop, you know. And, and I think about the, shall we say, the triviality of it as well. You know, Jews hold this and they do this. That is so far off the center. Mm. You need to be getting down into values to, to drill down into what it means, to look at how Jews live. I'm speaking for myself here, you know, to look at how Jews live in reality, 
in their own lives and the impact of that, of how they get by with things and the issues that we juggle with and so on, mm. the intercommunal issues, so on, that, that really represents real life and really sort of reveals and shows the impact that is actually going on. And the relevance goes up. You know, I think this is this big disconnect that really needs to be overcome there, I think. Yeah, that sounds like it's just a negative. No, not at all. And actually something I'm looking at doing in the next season is talking about people's lived experience. And what I've called for is for listeners to send me a voice message of the impact of whichever faith they're in on their life and how it influences them. Because I think this is this is real. This is lived experience. This is authentic. This is people talking about their lived experiences. So just anyone listening, if you'd like to talk about how your faith influences your life, then please get in touch. I want to ask now, Rabbi, a difficult question and a difficult subject that we've touched upon just earlier in the episode, which is about, mm. one, whether we should teach the Holocaust and associate that with Judaism, mm. whether we need to move on from that, and if we do teach it, how do we do it without pigeonholing Judaism? Yeah, it's very, very difficult to do that because, again, it can rapidly become a subject that the children view as merely history and something which is therefore disconnected from today. I think the Holocaust, first and foremost, should be taught. I think, though, it needs to be taught within a framework that is beyond the mere victimization approach, possibly, if that's the right word. What I mean by that is that the Holocaust should be taught as historical causes of it in the sense of marginalization of minorities stigmatization of minorities beginning to allow public approbation of minorities the breakdown of thresholds that people need to cross before they can legitimately attack minorities looking at it in that way and showing how society german society changed to make it possible that rank and file members of the public in the end accepted, mentally accepted, not just the persecution of Jews, but their death in gas chambers. That process seriously needs to be examined within the classroom, I think, because that process is happening today. Mm. It is still happening today. And it's, it's not just for Jewish people, it's happening for other minority groups as well. Yeah. And it's got to be highlighted as a cultural process that ultimately leads to an extinction program. Yeah. And it must not happen again. It just simply must not. On the anti-Semitic side, that also needs to be talked about. But I think there are two sides of this. There is an ancient Christian legacy that goes around this, which is deeply, deeply unfortunate. It's a legacy that Hitler himself employed in his own policies and politics. You may not be aware of this, but on the German uniform and some on the badges, I don't know if it's on the SS badges, but they had, you know, imprinted God is with us. And they genuinely believed that God was on their side in killing Jews. It was a, a holy policy which they saw in their own Roman Catholic, because many of the Nazis were Catholics. They saw it as their policy to do this on behalf of God. Now, that political agenda comes from the ancient Christian view that it was the Jews who killed Jesus mm. and therefore they aside, right? Jews killed God, which is a nonsense statement in itself. I mean, how ridiculous. But that charge of deicide was laid at the Jews' feet as a reason for the persecution of Judaism and Jews, saying the Jews killed Jesus. Now, of course, it, historically, it is utterly false to claim that. If you want to do it on a raw history level, it was the Romans that killed yeah. Yeshua, it was not the Jewish people. We simply didn't have the power mm. in the first century to do that. We were already a colonized land by the Roman Empire. That power to put anyone to death was not ours. We didn't do it. We couldn't do it. It had to go through the Roman channels, which is, of course, what exactly as the scriptures say happened. And even then, if you want to go down that road, you know, on a theological level, most Christians believe that actually Yeshua died for people's sins, and therefore it was people's sin that put him to death, not, not anyone. And, and it's just crazy, therefore, to blame any national group for this. Mm. But the legacy of this thing, this Christian anti-Semitism that's come down the ages, and replacement theology on the back of that, has directly led to anti-Semitism for the last 2,000 years. I can't be more blunt than that. It is true. It's a historical fact. 
and it is the church which has had the stain of Jewish blood on its hands for 2,000 years mm. as a result of this theology. So how do we approach it? I think it must be taught. I think it's got to be put in its historical perspective. The Holocaust was only the last in a long line of Holocaust in many ways. You go back to the book of Esther in the scriptures, you know, in Babylonian times, when the order went out to annihilate all Jews. Nimrod, back in Genesis 11, you know, tried to kill Abraham and his family and so on. You can find this pattern all the way through history, the Inquisition and so on. And there are many smaller levels that the blood libel in the UK that started in Norwich of William, William of Norwich, who's supposedly mixing blood with the Passover Mapsa and so on. All of these blood libels and everything that have begun all have their roots within the Christian framework. It's tragic in the last 2000 years, but it is true. And I think therefore, when the Holocaust is taught, it should be put within the broader historical context of what we're dealing with. It is unique. I, I do want to stress that. I'm not one of these people who's just as it's a one amongst the many. I, I don't mean to diminish the pain and, and hurt of other communities who've suffered this, but when you've actually got a policy of literally killing every last remaining Jew on the planet, which Hitler had, it is a unique event mm. on that level. It is literally unique and tragic that you know, six million plus the million of children and everything else. And I'm not diminishing the death of the Christians and the gypsies and the disabled and the homosexuals and everything else. I'm not diminishing that. It was dreadful what went on. But within that spectrum, the Jewish people had a very unique seat because Hitler decided that he was literally going to exterminate the whole nation of people. And there is that unique element to it in that way. So, yeah, it must be taught, mm. definitely. Yeah. I mean, I'd say, yeah, I think you're right. I think it's not necessarily unique if we look at Rwanda and, and what happened there in, in the 90s. I understand that, yeah. Yeah. I think what we have is a bigger picture, which is let's be... There's a history to it which seats it as a unique developments within yeah. that long tradition of yeah. anti-Semitism. But I think that's what it is. It's let's have a look at the conditions by which that happened. What happened in the 50 yeah. years before that, or 100, 150 years yeah. of anti-Semitism that then justified yeah. that as a solution. Yeah. And actually, let's have a look at how we're marginalising groups now. Exactly. Work with the history department, yeah. you know, and do a topic on the yeah. Second World War and the Holocaust. Yeah. History teacher, RS teacher together would give enormous yeah. relevance yeah. to that whole area yeah. suddenly, which the children wouldn't otherwise see. Yeah, absolutely. Ash, is there anything you want to say just as a response to that? Yeah, because I think a good outcome for looking at it with regards to that approach, with regards to looking at it as conditions that have a, an eventual outcome, is that mm. you lose then the idea that it's just a one-off occurrence and that you lose the idea that, oh, it's just one person that happens to have an agenda and all that. That one person in that particular instance happened to be yeah. a product yeah. of a particular set of conditions which we consistently keep repeating. And that's the thing. And it's, I think, a really good tool, actually, which, I, in fact, I, I recently tweeted out, was something called the Pyramid of Hate, mm -hmm. where if you just go through the various stages of prejudice and discrimination over generations, it begins to gradually become more normalised. Yeah, exactly. Until, eventually, genocide becomes very normal for a select Absolutely. group as well. So I think it's a really, really important point that you've made, that if we look yeah. at it from a historical perspective, where we are able to recognize the conditions then it means that mm. anybody can literally be mm. the perpetrator yep. and anybody can be the victim yeah. from something like this and then everyone then has buy-in to try Correct. and stop it from Correct. happening again and we must not let this happen again we know we are beginning to see the rise of anti-semitism across europe in the uk you know we had our own synagogue daubed with a swastika a few months back we had some anti-semitic hate crimes committed against the synagogue the police were involved it's beginning to happen again Mm. and it's being publicly allowed it's beginning to be more acceptable i just saw something this morning of some anti-semitic chanting on a flight as an orthodox jew was walking down the middle there to get his suitcase out it was in the jewish news this morning and you know the fact that you've got people there who were not joining in but were laughing and smiling and thinking it funny yeah that is the public acceptance level growing and that is where it starts. Yeah. And Ash, you talk a lot about this, don't you? That it's not enough to be not racist. You have to be anti-racist. Yeah. You've got to engage. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. You thought on like... If, yeah. It takes a lot of bravery to do that. But I think the more you engage with a topic, and this is what I said, I think it was yesterday I tweeted this, it's, it's honestly just about reading more and listening more. If you read and listen more, mm. then when it comes to the challenge presenting itself, you're in a much more stronger position to, one, keep your head in that situation as well. Because 
when you have knowledge, you're able to stay calmer in that situation as well because you know what's coming. Yeah. And the thing is, is that you're then able to handle the, the situation in a much more calmer manner. And, and then systematically through, whether it is a conversation, for example, systematically dismantle each part of that person's narrative. Yeah. I, I know I've given the scenario of a one-on-one conversation. I know there's a number of scenarios that happen, but I mean, I suppose it's slightly separate, but in terms of something like this, where they talk about anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, just anti-racism as a whole, in a sense, is that the more that you empower yourself to be able to have that conversation, it's never easy. It's never an easy conversation to have. No. No. But it's certainly a necessary one. No, it must be taught. And actually, that's what we're doing as RE teachers, isn't it? That's exactly it. That's what we're doing as RE teachers. You know, we're empowering our young people to challenge the messages that they're being given and to understand the problems and the impact of certain attitudes that are normalised in today's society. Just as we close, Rabbi, is there anything else that you feel that we need to do to make our teaching of this varied faith more authentic in our classroom? Yeah, my final thought really would be is please make it a living faith, you know, in the Judaism as a living faith. One of my more painful experiences, I went to the Jewish Museum in Berlin a few years ago and I stood looking at one of these glass boxes and inside the glass box was a prayer shawl and a Torah scroll. And I stood there and I thought, that's not a historical, you know, what, what is that? What is that doing in there? Yeah. I, I use this every Saturday, you know, and it really did shock me. And it's how we perceive things that, and this, again, this is an element about the pictures and the, and the textbooks and things that we use, which really send wrong images. It's a living faith and a faith that does impact the world that is you know is involved in politics and the cut and thrust of it and, and in that way try and not just say oh look at what jews believed in the past yeah which some still do and you know it, it just presents it as archaic and ancient and mm. actually judaism is a very vibrant living modern faith and certainly in messianic judaism it is i don't want to over egg it in other areas but you know but i would say reform and liberal would also see themselves in that way too you know, we're not disconnected from the world. We're very much connected with it, very much alive. These are symbols and, and things that we use within the faith, which are deeply meaningful and are used today in a living way and transmit, convey spiritual messages to the community and everything else when they're being used in the usual kind of faith way. But to see them as disconnected from what happens today is doing harm. So please just present it as a living faith not something that's just a relic of the olden days and they're there, never mind, eh? <laughs> and can I ask, obviously you've mentioned the Ten Commandments as being a basis of law and morality, in certainly in England, and my historical oh. knowledge is, <laughs> is, is not good enough, but certainly massively impacted laws and morality around the world. Is there anything else yeah. you feel that, that Judaism has contributed to British culture? Well, that's a, that's a deep question, isn't it, really? I mean, I suppose in many ways, <laughs> Judaism in the broadest sense of the word, including Messianic Judaism. You know, Messianic Judaism existed within the Roman Empire for at least a thousand years. Again, it's not common knowledge, but it did. The last Messianic Jewish communities that we're aware of now, according to some of the research that we've been involved with, were dying out around about the thousand, turn of the thousand CE. And it's well known, of course, that Messianic Jewish believers, Jewish believers, therefore, came to the UK during Roman times still um founding communities like the iona community and things like that were founded mm. by messianic jews and we know from again from their history as well that they were saturday keeping they were shabbat keeping so we know that the origins of these communities is very much jewish so i guess if there was a broader message that comes out of all of this that's come down the years is of monotheism i think that there is one true God. Mm. And, you know, we look at the impact in Britain, England, like, you know, I'm not an ancient historian of Britain, so forgive me if I use the wrong terms, but the old Celtic deities and so on, which were all put to one side as early Messianic Judaism slash Christianity, if you want to call it that, at that point began to get a foothold in Britain but it, through the Roman Empire. But I think that even underneath that, the fact that even Christians will tell you they believe in one God comes from Judaism. Mm. You know, Christian opinion, it's a Jewish concept. It came from Judaism. And in many ways, that is our biggest cultural legacy and inheritance that we've given the world, that there is a God to whom we will all ultimately give account. Mm. And I, I think that in faith terms, that's had a huge impact, not just with the Ten Commandments, but just in terms of how we structure our lives and, mm. and how we behave. 
difficult to quantify, I would okay. suspect. I mean, right. you know, you, you, you're, yeah. in, you're yeah, in more yeah, yeah. slightly ethereal context at that point, but but I suspect in terms of mm. political, social, cultural paradigms by which we all live, this certainly impacted that in very deep points. Well, I've just really enjoyed having you. It's been, <laughs> it's been absolutely fantastic. And I'm <laughs> like, it's, it, like I was saying, it's, like, it's not all my pleasure. Speechless, and I really, really am because I've, I've learned so much from you. And just thank you so much for your time. Because I think one thing that I've really gained from this experience with you, Rabbi, is that especially when you talk about the community literally being a living faith, a community that was almost, I don't know if this is the right word, but almost discovered and then given a label. And we found that within my own community, the Sanatan right. community as well, that it were a community yeah. within Northwest India that were discovered and labelled effectively. And it's something where I'm thinking, oh, hang on, this is quite a common theme that's occurring as well. <laughs> and I thought that was a really interesting point that he made. Read Brent's book on Beyond Religion because he has a whole chapter in there about how Christian missionaries literally defined religion around the world by what they met and encountered when they went out as Christians to Christian colonize the world. It's a fascinating chapter. I think both of you, I think, by sounds that we've really enjoyed reading it. It's called Beyond Religion by Brent Nagormi, I think his surname is. Yeah, brilliant book, but I can only recommend it strong. It'll brilliant. say a lot to you. Brilliant. Well, <laughs> Go on then, Ashley, let's do anything to say. We, we'll just come to a close. No, no, I've got, I've got no questions now. But yeah, <laughs> we've got so a lot of thinking that. to do, haven't we? <laughs> a lot of pondering and questioning yeah, and yeah, reading yeah. and all this kind of stuff. So yeah. a lot of work to do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's our homework. So. Well, yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's good. That's good. Then um, my job is done today. So, and, and Ash, lovely to meet you too up, up in Yorkshire, you, I imagine. So enjoy the countryside and and yeah. louisa lovely to see you again and i'm more than happy to have another encounter if you want sure, at some sure. point but so rabbi thank you so much thank you louisa my name is louisa jane smith and who are you ash and i'm ash kundi uh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> you're just i am <laughs> that's that's how god refers to himself in the <laughs> Actually, yeah, I was just about to say for a Jewish concept, I thought yeah. I should certainly not be saying that. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm expecting a bottle of smoke in your chair in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You say that I am. And this has been the RE podcast discussing the decolonisation of RE. Thank you so much for listening.